Hello and welcome to Minter Dial, episode number 511. My name is Minter Dial and I'm your host for this podcast, a proud member of the Evergreen Podcast Network. For more information or to check out the ever-growing list of shows on their network, please visit evergreenpodcast.com. So this week's interview is my old chum from INSEAD, Alex Connock, now doctor, who's an academic in media business and artificial intelligence at Oxford University and who has been shortlisted six times as Entrepreneur of the Year. He's also vice chair at UNICEF UK. And most recently, he's author of the book, Media Management and Artificial Intelligence, Understanding Media Business Models in the Digital Age, published by Routledge. In this conversation with Alex, we discuss his career and his pivoting into academia. We look at the arrival of generative AI and how tools like ChatGPT will change so many industries, including media and education. We explore the impact of AI on news, cinema, and teaching, the implications for copyright, and for those working in marketing and the creative industries, and a whole lot more. You'll find all the show notes on minterdial.com as usual. And if you have a moment, please go over and drop in a rating and review. It always helps. And don't forget to subscribe to catch all the future episodes. Now for the show. Dr. Alex Connock. Well, you know, I don't have that many of my old classmates from NCAD, but it's always fun to have a cheery, familiar face in front of me. Alex, in your own words, who are you? Well, it's great to be here, Mentor. Um, I am indeed a colleague of yours from um, INSEAD back in the day. We did an MBA together. And um, I am now a... Um, uh, a doctor uh, and a lecturer at uh, Oxford University, uh, and I cover marketing and um, artificial intelligence for business. And I, I'm kind of a specialist in the media field, um, and the, particularly the where the media business interfaces with artificial intelligence. I'm uh, like you, I worked in industry for some time, um, and then I moved to academia at a certain point in life, and now I'm at Oxford University. And what a change that that has been alex uh, what 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 inspired you to to shift from being in the industry to academia well i think i think if you talk to a lot of people in the kind of advertising and marketing and media industries you find that there's a kind of academic monkey in them and they actually a lot of what you read particularly in advertising is quite um, academic in style and approach there's a lot of data a lot of analysis a lot of quite clear thinking if you go to can lion you'll see lots of presentations which are very academic in their style even if the even if there's a kind of a gloss of uh, presentation or verb on top of it um so i'd always had a kind of itch that i wanted to scratch academically and after um you know having some 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 great successes and great lacks of success in the media which everyone has in media careers mm-hmm. i said i decided that i wanted to kind of flip and and sort of pivot as to use the industry parlance uh, into mm-hmm. trying out academia and it was a really interesting switch to make i mean that's not what we're here to talk about today but <clears throat> if we were i would say what's quite interesting about any pivot is that it's both easier and harder than i had imagined it to be and we could talk about that later if you like but i'm sure you'd probably relate to that yourself well i think it's a, a relevant topic for for everybody you know young or old you're you find yourself in a place and you have an itch and should you move should you leave uh, an installed base an easy salary be an entrepreneur and and there's a lot of a lot more options to us than there were, let's say, in our parents' generation, where they typically were encouraged to work for thirty years in the same place. I mean, that's just mm. typically, but yeah. And I think if, if I was going to offer one piece of advice to people, I think it would be if you're thinking of a, of a change, of a pivot, be very decisive about it. So I think what you probably can't do is kind of dip your toe in and imagine that you're going to join this other world and this other system, uh, but also on a sort of part-time basis. I think you have to go all in. That sort of makes sense in a way. Like if I suddenly decided that I wanted to stop being a chartered accountant and become a player for Manchester United, I couldn't really sort of turn up on Tuesday afternoon at training and say, oh, hi, yeah, I'm here to do training and then maybe I'll right. play on Saturday. You know, people would say, well, you know, you really have to be here for training every day and, you know, you have to really be all in on this. And I think the same is true in any, any profession. I think if I see people get it wrong on a pivot, it's probably because they think that that somehow their success in one field entitles them to a kind of work light approach in a different field. Kind of, And I, I don't think that's true. I'm not sure it was ever true, but I'm sure it's not true now. That makes so so much sense. There's a, a topic I, I often pick up with people is, well, my side hustle is, and so I'm working in this yeah. business, 
I just do it because I, you know, I'm good at it. But really what I'd like to do is a side hustle. And I suppose in the end of the day, to take your term at some level, what they're missing is the hustle part. They actually, they aren't doing the real hustle. They just have it as a pretend side hobby and, and they don't recognize all the, the difficulty it will be to actually plunge into it. So better to go whole hog mm. if you really want to do it. Otherwise, it's just an excuse for complaining about your current work. Yeah, and also every profession is not just a kind of certificate on the wall. It's an entire social graph and it's a social network that you have to join in, in which you have to build kudos, credibility, connections, uh, kind of edges to put it in the sort of um, network graph terminology. And that that's something that takes years to do and you have to be all in to achieve it. So, so if I was in a medieval village and I was... Um, you know, a, a farmer, and I decided I wanted to become a, an ironmonger. I couldn't. I couldn't necessarily do that because what I'd have to do is first prove my worth as an ironmonger, then then create an entire network of all the people who bought and sold the materials that I needed, and that would take years to achieve. And so I think one has to um, quite um, deliberately double down and really focus on developing the social graph that's necessary for a new career, as well as the sort of qualifications, if you will. Before getting into your new book, Media Management and Artificial Intelligence, um, Alex, I'd love to hear a little bit about your life as a teacher. You and I both uh, had fun at INSEAD uh, a few years back. What? How would you describe your the, the people who are signing up for classes today uh, for, for MBAs, business school, Saeed school stuff? <laughs> As opposed to mm. what we knew and who we were, how would you qualify the type of candidates you're seeing these days? Well, interestingly enough, I get to teach at a number of different levels, which is actually fascinating. And it, it's not automatically the case that the more senior the level, the better the people or the more interesting the teaching. So I teach undergraduates at Oxford and I teach 19-year-olds um, who are doing economics and management. And it's actually the hardest course in Britain, I'm told, to get into. And so you have very, very bright 18, 19, 20-year-olds. And that's incredibly stimulating and um, kind of all, uh, quite gratifying in a way to be part of that because you realise you're dealing with young people who are, who are really intelligent, very diverse, much more diverse than when I was at Oxford a, lot, a long time ago, even before I met you at INSEAD. Then I teach MBA, and that tends to be people in their mid to late 20s. Uh, they have a certain kind of knowledge of the world. Quite, some of them are quite confident about their knowledge of the world, but they're also very hungry to learn. They're very similar to the people I think probably we met at INSEAD. Um, what's interesting is the, is the trends that, that ebb and flow. So a few years ago, uh, you know, it was all, um, I'm going to do a green startup. And then more recently, it was going to be, I'm going to do a metaverse startup. And now it's, I'm going to do an AI startup and so forth. And so people tend to to follow the wider industry trends in terms of their uh, ambitions. And that also flexes between an entrepreneurial focus and a kind of corporate focus. So I think the more one's in recession, the more one finds people going into consulting and and banking and other sort of traditional industries, if you will. And the more uh, there's a kind of boom economy or a, you know, a bull market, the more you find people going into the more sort of risque entrepreneurial areas. That's really interesting. And then finally, I run executive programs, including one in artificial intelligence, where you meet people in their kind of late 30s, early 40s who are really at the top of the game. And then you realize that you, you couldn't possibly have more wisdom than the collected room. And so your job becomes slightly different. It becomes to kind of help uh, sort of co-locate and, and to co-create knowledge in the room and hear about someone from the French nuclear industry or the Saudi tourist industry or whatever it might be, and try and use that information and knowledge to sort of help everyone else um, up their understanding. And I think the great paradox that I've really understood there is that actually when people first arrive, they sometimes go, oh, but I'm a management consultant in Germany. What could I possibly need to learn about the coffee industry in Costa Rica or whatever it might be? And actually, you find that at the end, people generally tend to say the colleagues and classmates that I learned the most from are the ones who had the most different job from me. And I think that's kind of quite a good principle in life in a way is that we sometimes get ourselves locked into tunnels of a particular industry or particular niche within an industry. And yet, if we kind of open our eyes and look at completely different walks of life or different countries, we, we might find that actually we can learn even more and, and sort of reinvent uh, the, our industries and, and cultures and so forth. And so it's a really fascinating job, actually. I'm very lucky. Hmm. It makes me rem reminds me of of how headhunters, for example, executive search executive uh, will will hire people only from the same industry for an industry. Or generally, the brief is, well, I want someone my industry has fifteen years of experience in my industry, 
and and how bringing in people with different backgrounds, uh, as I think also academic different academic backgrounds like the humanities, can really be enriching for for strategy and figuring out things like AI. Mm, oh, absolutely, because AI in, in in AI specifically, diversity is an absolute sine qua non. I'm sure we can get into that when we start talking about the training data sets that are used to um, sort of run these algorithms and and, and the, the, the bad data in or undiverse data in will absolutely invariably produce bad results on the way out. But I think even more broadly, there's just tons of evidence that diverse teams, really diverse teams and diversity in every sense, just do function better. They make less mistakes, they're more creative and they're more resilient. And I think that's probably something that has changed since we were at INSEAD, you know, if, if, if we're honest, when we were at INSEAD, it was probably quite white, I, w- I think, probably the class, wasn't it? If you think mm. about the kind of demographics of it, quite Western, quite white. And the and the content we looked at was quite Anglo-American, even though we were in France. And I think now one, what one's really seeing is a much more diverse footprint of the kind of examples one look at. When I did my book, I was very deliberate about making sure that I looked at Asia and Africa, just as much as I looked at the, the Americas, uh, in order to try and reflect the world as it actually is. And I think the value that you get out of that is that you get a much more rich and um, real uh, sort of footprint, intellectual footprint in your courses, which um, is only to the benefit of everyone who's uh, participating in them. One last question before we get into the book, which is um, quite topical and relates to our friends at OpenAI. Chat GPT, we talk about it being something of a threat uh, to mm. the academic world and and how students will be running off and writing papers thanks to Chat GPT in the tone of uh, you know, Dr. Hume or whatever. Um, <laughs> what kind of conversation is is happening at Oxford or in your various roles, Alex, ar- around this? Is there a concern? What Where are we on that? Well, I don't, I have to say, I haven't been part of any conversations where people are particularly concerned by ChatGPT and its current iteration. That, that may change with GPT-4 when it comes in, which has got a much more massive data set and will probably be much more powerful, even than the kind of enhanced GPT-3 that lies behind ChatGPT. Um, I think that I am yet to see a sophisticated analytical essay delivered Um via chat gpt that in any way matches one delivered by an actual real person and so whilst i'm sure people are using things like chat chat gpt for the structuring potentially some initial research some sort of passing you know p-a-r-s-i-n-g of the data and so forth i'm yet to convince that someone would go better than about a c grade on on even the most modest exam with a chat gpt type tool and actually i think it, it i think i've seen people in the university sector in general comment that Actually, it could be a good thing because it could it could enable and encourage universities to double down on really soliciting analysis, both um, written and verbal from students and to spend even less time focused on the kind of rote repetition of a fact of a fact base. And so when I've set exams recently, which I have done at Oxford, actually, I've been quite specific about making sure the questions are quite um kind of direct and sophisticated such that it wouldn't really be possible to get the right answer out of a chat GPT type of tool, even if that were available in an exam situation. So I think on the on balance, it will be a positive. And I think that we would be naive and foolish to somehow imagine we could turn the clock back to a world before natural language processing. So what we should do instead is focus on all the potential benefits um, of uh, things like AI and uh, the ways that, that they can enable us to have an even better and richer and more analytical education. Yeah, that makes sense to look at it positively, because as you say, we can't really put it back in the box. Uh, there's been some research that already suggests that it's capable of getting a C, C minus anyway. Mm. And and it does. Uh, I think it it should wake up some uh, of the exam makers who tend to, or the, there seems to be a policy. My daughter has been brought up in the English system, uh, and so I've been a little closer to that. Of a, such a a protocol to the way you need to write papers. It needs to be mm. formulated in this way. You need to say this number of facts that you have to have this type of structure and so on. So as soon as we're in that kind of a mindset, that's programming in, mm. in a human term. 
and I hopefully will will push towards being a little bit more creative, having more flexibilities in this manner. Because it, it, it for me, it just seems like a shortcut on how to mock paper when you can just say tick. Well, there are 10, 10 references. That's right. Tick, 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 tick. Uh, this this structure is not what I asked for. Not not good. And, and therefore penalized as opposed to making the the student think differently, use their let's say human skills, empathy, creativity, intuition, uh, courage, <laughs> to do something a little bit differently in their in their text. Mm, mm, absolutely. Yeah, I think I think look, listen, I think I think these are all um tremendous new exciting opportunities. It's actually kind of rather thrilling situation to be in. I mean if I could slightly segue um, it was quite interesting because when I um, was thinking about doing this book on uh, um, the media and AI, uh, about as you know, you, you you kind of write a proposal and you send it off to the publishers, and the, what they often do is they often refer it off to um, kind of anonymized academics around the world who offer their usually quite snooty views on whether it's a good idea or not. And in this case, lots of the views came back, and they were like, "Why would anyone want to write a book about media and AI? They're two completely different things." You know, the media yeah. is an industry that consists of publishing, television, film exhibition, and yeah. and 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 uh, AI is a you know, technical, statistical, and analytical tool, and the, the two barely relate to each other. And of course, fast forward to today, these things have completely collided, and, and literally t never a day now when the media and AI are not conflated in the same story on the front page of the FT, the Wall Street Journal, the Times, in you know every single day. And that's true today, amongst other days. Um, and I think that that same collision of subjects uh, with with AI is happening across the world, from astronomy to zoology, and that's incredibly fascinating. So the very nature of how universities are organized and how people's careers are thought about may be changing as um, we all acquire a kind of much, some of the sort of facility and translatability of um, AI in our actual human skill set. Does that make any sense? It makes total sense. I mean, at the end of the day, the, the hint is in media where you have mm. so many different ways that AI is touching on things like image, video, voice, and such. So let's get into your book, Alex, because I absolutely want to, to talk about this. I mean, it's it's a chef d'oeuvre, as we say in French. Uh, how, how, did you, how long did you take to write it? Because it really is very comprehensive, very thick stuff. And and you really well, it's very it's a, a listen, this, this is an absolutely fascinating subject. And um, wh wh when I first went into the media in the 1990s, uh, when I first met you actually as well, we could really think about the media as these different um, buildings along Sixth Avenue in New York. You know, you had the magazine building and the TV building and the film building. And the, and uh, apart from sort of having lunch in the same restaurants, those industries barely ever met. And that was the way that academic thinking about the media had been organised thus far. So so there was an there were these kind of rather sort of um, arcane sounding things like film distribution that, or film exhibition that people, only people who are actually in the industry really understood. And, and people were, people had the industry sort of segmented up into those verticals. And what I sort of thought about was actually now, if you think about the social media world and the world where NVIDIA chips are powering everything from games to AI solutions and where podcasting is publishing and publishing is to a certain extent video production and YouTube is a distribution channel for everything from films to podcasting. Actually, the media has fundamentally changed and those old vertical sectors really no longer apply. They just don't apply. You know, there isn't really a difference between the film and television industry in some ways because they're both producing the film production anyway is, is largely producing for streamers, as is the television industry. So it was time to sort of rethink things. And that enabled me to kind of sit down with a piece of paper and trying to sort of sketch out a different way of understanding the media. And I thought that the kind of lingua franca, you know, the kind of Rosetta Stone to doing that was probably the stuff that we call AI, which is actually a bunch of all different things. And that is actually explaining almost all the changes that are taking place in the media. So it's changing who the big players are. So whereas in the 1990s, the big players would have been kind of Paramount and um, CBS and Vi you know, Viacom as it was then and, and all these other kind of sort of um, well-known corporations. Actually, now the main the main producers and controllers of media distribution are actually Amazon and, and uh, Apple and, and Meta and, and Alphabet. And so there was, it was really time to just sit down and start again and sort of think, well, how can we reframe some sort of textbook or course, university course about the media in a slightly more fluid way between the sectors, looking at a world where 
social distribution is almost universal, you know, TikTok, Instagram, uh, YouTube, uh, and all, all the various other iterations of that around the world, and where content is, is, is universally multi-platform. And where things like AI are really changing how we use it. So what was the defining technology of the last 10 years in the media? Probably recommendation algorithms. So they were es essentially uh, sort of initiated by Netflix in about 2007. They ran a competition offering a million dollars for someone to invent the best recommendation algorithm, which is interesting. At the same time as Blockbuster were refusing to meet them on the basis that they were these kind of interlopers who couldn't possibly um, compete with Blockbuster's um, monopolistic gr grip on the DVD rentals business. Bye, you know, fast bye, forward even four years later and Blockbuster had gone bust and Netflix was, you know, t taking over the world with that content recommendation, which went on to define it through the whole teens. Imagine how fast we could solve the world's biggest problems if more SaaS startups would gain traction sooner. Welcome to the Tech Entrepreneur on a Mission podcast. This podcast is dedicated to sharing experiences from B2B SaaS CEOs who are going above and beyond to deliver change that is noticed. You will hear their secrets and learn what is required to build a SaaS business that the world starts talking about and keeps talking about and how to overcome the roadblocks to do so. Yeah, you, you mentioned lingua franca, and, I, and that was one thing you read at the very beginning of the book. I, I sort of underlined, and I said, whoa, there are only two lingua franca in the world, 7,100 languages, but only two lingua franca, media and computer code. I'd love for you to just elaborate on that. Well, I mean, that, that's my view. I mean, I'm sure other people would have different views, but I think what, what I would definitely contend is that both media and computer code are lingua franca. So if you went to... North Korea, you would find people who could, you know, computer code or, you know, or any country on earth that would computer code. And media, um, you know, um, BTS, you know, Jaws, you know, Harry Potter, Star Wars, these are all quasi-universal tropes of humanity. And that, that puts the media in a very special place, a different place from management consulting or the plastics industry the media has a kind of cultural relevancy and cultural hold on people globally in a very special way and that makes it a particularly interesting subject to study so if you know if you if, if you're talking about sonic the hedgehog there is something different from that than talking about the best-selling cement in the world there is something mm. sort of psychically different about it so to answer your original question you know why did i get to, about to doing a book about the media and how it is now because it's just incredibly interesting and it's interesting not just to me but actually to someone on a, on a bus you could just get on a bus and say let's talk about sonic the hedgehog and you know did you know it's the most popular you know uh, one of the most popular media franchises of all time people go yes i did and why you know and i've been playing that since 1995 and you know my brother plays it and so it's a it, you know call of duty or any of these things they're just fantastically interesting and everybody has a sort of innate understanding everyone knows that you swipe up on tiktok or instagram for short short videos everyone knows that short videos are a thing everybody knows that spotify is a great source of music everybody understands the basic business model of it so this is a really lovely place to play even if even if it's just a you know a course that you take because you really want to take a to run a career as a school teacher or, or what have you. Well, I, I I'm going to partly agree and partly disagree. Um, so in the partly agree, the idea of being able to talk with anybody about media as long as it's entertainment, games, uh, I think that is a a nice playground as you as you said. On the other hand, AI and news media, uh, that conversation can go quickly ballistic. Yes. Well, I mean, yes, we could certainly come on to that. And and um, the, even in the last couple of weeks, there have been really two dimensions uh, by which um, news media has encountered quite dystopian, you know, dystopian meaning um, sort of problematic um, issues. And one was the use of AI tools to write stories. So um, a, a online newsletter called CNET in America was doing it. And also various financial firms, including some big famous ones, use AI writers now. And that poses lots of questions about what's going to happen to young journalists or sort of starter jobs in general, about right. what the nature of truth is, about fact checking, about humans work with AI. And then, of course, the other um, sort of often uh, repeated trope is that deep fakes, meaning um, humans, vi human video created by deep learning that looks real and sounds real, are going to take over and we're not going to be able to believe our news media anymore. And that hasn't really come to pass yet. 
but it's just starting to become an issue. And I think if we could, it probably could after 15 years of hype actually become something real in the next year or two uh, where disinformation pivots from uh, sort of bots on Twitter and, and what have you to actual uh, sort of seamlessly uh, believable video, which then creates all kinds of news issues and credibility and, and issues, especially in the time of, as we are, unfortunately, a time of war. Well, I mean, I would argue that the the state of confidence and trust in media anyway, going into it with humans and the business models that have come out of the internet has made a lot of people more skeptical, unless you're a Russian person living mm. in the middle of Russia, listening to Rosia Tsavadny or something where it's all pro you know propaganda from the state. But it's already mm. pretty cynical. And, and when you get well, yeah. into the... The abilities mm. that, that can come with AI, it's going to get worse. Well, I mentioned recommend recommendation algorithms earlier on in the context of Netflix. And, you know, I was effectively saying how fabulous they are and how brilliant it is that they've worked out that I only like watching thrillers, but occasionally like French ones or whatever it might be. Hmm. But of course, there's a danger with that. And the danger is the rabbit hole. And even on Netflix, I see it. So I actually, I actually had to go and create a second Netflix identity, a kind of artsy version of me who went to the, who went to sort of art cinemas and, and liked watching you know documentaries and things. Because the original Netflix algo had figured out that all it wanted to play me was dystopian thrillers. And I think that that is um, sort of a microcosm of a much bigger problem, which particularly we saw post 20 or pre, pre and post 2016 with the US election and YouTube and then the Facebook, whereby um, people were being taken down rabbit holes of radicalization, where the algorithm was essentially maximizing engagement and working out that the best way to maximize engagement was actually to maximize enragement um, and such that, that people who believed in one conspiracy theory or one, you know, sort of right wing um, fantasy were then offered others because the algorithm had figured out that there was a sort of editorial similarity between uh, um, anti-vaxxing and 5G theories. Um, and so and so had conflated the two and would build audiences who, who, who had kind of sort of multi-conspiracy beliefs by virtue of recommendation algorithm, which wasn't properly intervened in. And so that that problem of recommendation is something that that plays out across so much of media today. So a lot of what people are worried about in the States with TikTok is the supposed ability of the Chinese government to tilt the, the algorithm towards certain types of recommendation, whether that be anti-democracy or whatever. I'm not sure anyone's presented any actual evidence of any of that, to be honest, but that's the theory. And um, we are seeing it in uh, sort of sociological terms around teenage um, self-harm, for example, or any number of other issues. So this AI-driven world, a world of algorithmic recommendation, which is very different from the top-down world of media commissioning that was around in the 1990s, is something that we're, we're yet to figure out. And in fact, if we went beyond that into other things that are hitting the media, an even bigger one that we haven't figured out yet is copyright. So we haven't yet talked about that, Minter, but that is a absolutely fascinating area of media, which is fundamental to how we create and sell Harry Potter or Star Wars. And yet no one has figured out how copyright is going to work in the age of AI systems. Well, there are so many topics we can try to cover, Alex. You are so right about that. We're just circling mm -hmm. back on lingua franca. Uh, the comment I wanted to get into was how, uh, in my conversations with programmers, it remains a deeply English vernacular within mm. code that keeps it. Uh, so they will use finger even in Korea or whatever the other uh, language we're talking about. So it it's kind of the the interesting thing for me underneath that is that it remains English within the coding world as opposed to the media. And the mm. topic, one of the chapters which I really uh, plugged into was uh, entitled Factual. Merged distribution channels have changed a traditional industry. And this idea of fact and and mm -hmm. uh, fact checking and and truth, uh, that this mm. is this is this is part of the problem. We have um, the you know you can get you can get the internet to tell you to support any type of position these days. Mm. You can you can I mean, actually from if I did that. So one of the things we did at Oxford was we held a debate um, in the Oxford Union, which is a sort of famous debating chamber. And just as a last minute thought, we thought, oh, I know, let's have a let's have a participant in the debate that is an actual AI. So we had a debate about the ethics of AI and all these things that you and I are talking about now, and whether AI can be ethical and whether it can can create ethical behavior in society. And we just asked the AI, 
And of course, it gave us very articulate speeches, both for and against the motion that AI could could be ethical, mm. could foster ethical behavior. And, and what was fascinating is how viral that story went. And so we sort of, it was one of those situations where we put it on the internet somewhere in a sort of university blog one day and woke up the next day to find it had been sort of posted by the World Economic Forum and the Chinese news and you know every, everywhere in between. And that's because people are really wrestling with these issues and they haven't really resolved them yet. What, you know, what, what is ethical behavior? What is fact? What's truth? The, all these things are coming to pass. And of course they are made real in AI systems. So we started off today by talking about ChatGPT. And of course, one of the challenges that ChatGPT has and Google's Bard famously had last week when it was launched is, is how to be true, how to tell the truth. And so the problem Google had is, is the training data set apparently had some sort of confusion around when the first picture of the extra solar system uh, exoplanet had been taken, or whether it was taken by the James Webb Space Telescope or some other telescope. And Google published that it had been taken by James Webb, and then people t took a different view. And that was a rather lovely Petri dish for how truth is just a function of the training data set. And, and one of the big problems in ChatGPT, the much discussed already, is all it's doing is replicating what it's found in the training data, and that may not be strictly true. And so we can't, to return to your question, we can't be factual necessarily by using these systems because these systems are not flawless. They're, they're far from flawless. And that actually might create a problem whereby truth is hard to know in the modern age. And that, and that the very thing that's supposed to be this statistically robust source, AI actually becomes the, the, a problem. Yeah, I mean, the end of the day, the internet is a reflection of us. Mm. And the ideologues that started the internet, uh, lovely ideas of freedom and freedom of expression and all that, free, uh, well, it turns out you have to pay for things. And Mm. And people want to make money and and so uh, we made the internet what it is yeah and, and actually in a very real sense so so if you look at the data sets that are being used for some of the um tools out there so for example there's a tool called stable diffusion and there's a data set that it uses you can actually go on a website have i been trained where you can look at the training data set that is used by by these these sites and so when you say you know we, we are the internet or the internet is us it's literally true we can we can find out to what extent we are in the training data and one of the fascinating conundrums we're going to have to face up to as we go forward is that when meta humans are created, synthetic humans are created, th that's because a hundred million or a billion even faces have been scraped at, around the internet, one of which is ours. And so we are the training data for the new humans that are being created. And how do we how do we mitigate that? How do we manage that? How do we even think about it? Uh, how, how do we understand the copyright around it? How do we understand the ethical problems that might ge generate around it? So, so this is a very, very ph philosophically challenging time. And, you know, one of the thoughts I had is that I think this is a bigger time in the media as the invention of the printing press in the 15th century or the invention of radio in the very late 19th century or photography in the early 19th century. It's that existential. Generative AI creates that number of completely transformative changes in the way we perceive the world around us, which is both fascinating and quite alarming. Well, I will tend to 100% agree with you. And, and speaking of scraping images, there's this loony professor from Oxford that wrote a book and, and scraped an image of this beautiful young woman and, and put it on the cover, Mr. Dr. Connick. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Copyright. Let's just talk about copyright one second, um, because I um, have I used uh, Dali to generate an image that I have in my new book, and uh, so I went around, you know, looking at what was the copyrightability of that image uh, from Dali, and and can I use it? What sort of reference do I need to use? And the image I took was something that was uh, completely reconstituted, as opposed to some other person's photo of a of a valley uh, with a flower mm. and then just changed a little bit so that the the nature of the it, the change wasn't sufficient in this case it was uh, it was very new and it was looking at a, a machine that has empathy where are we mm. on on copyright within within this <clears throat> new world where everybody can create we are um, nowhere on copyright and i think that's what's very very fascinating these issues just simply haven't been resolved yet. So in the United States, it's impossible to patent an image which is created by an AI system in the same way that it's impossible to patent one that's painted by an elephant, for example. 
Um, copyright is very challenging. Uh, there are at least two very interesting legal cases uh, going on at the moment. One where Getty Images, uh, which is a very big photo library, the kind sure. of the quintessential photo library, is taking legal action towards Stable Diffusion, which is one of the creators of um, imagery, that, such as the one stuff you mentioned, mm -hmm. a London-based, uh, very brilliant company called Stable Diffusion, Stability AI. And they're challenging them on the basis that that uh, if if I'm right that the um, that they they believe stable to and ingested into its data set um, getting images without the copyright permission of getting images and stable diffusion take a different view. They argue that they're not uh, simply replicating getting images. Um, they can put it much better than I do, but that's the essence of it. There are some artists in the United States. Um, also taking legal action against these platforms, arguing that their vernacular, their style, their, the very essence of their art has been essentially ripped off and therefore that they're due, due uh, royalties. And again, they weren't um, given uh, the choice of whether or not they went into the training data set. Um, so, so these issues have not been resolved yet. And that is having implications. So I talked to one of the biggest game companies in the world, video games, and they said, you know, they really can't use generative AI um, worlds in their games because they have to be very careful not to integrate unwittingly someone else's copyright. Because if someone else's copyright goes into the games, the world, the background world of a game, then another party could rip off that game and say, well, you never owned the copyright in the first place because you didn't have the underlying copyright for the, the game's assets that were in there. Um, that's uh, impacting advertising. So people are trying to figure out, and I've talked to some of the world's biggest ad agencies, trying to figure out how to use these incredible tools, particularly in kind of programmatic ad, ad distribution, where you can do what I'm sure you know with dynamic creative optimization, where you create many thousands of different versions of an ad using different imagery to make sure that the each individual gets the perfect image that's most likely to make them buy the pizza or whatever it is. Um, again, who's who's going to own those assets? If I if I went on to Midjourney, which is one of the picture generators, and said, "Create me an image of the perfect pepperoni pizza," who would truly own that pizza, um, that image? Because would it would there at some level be some copyright residing in the people who'd uploaded previous images of pepperoni pizza to the internet, who had not been paid, but potentially not been paid for their contribution? So these issues are just not resolved, and lawyers are just beginning to get their heads around it. And I'm quite sure that people are going into the legal industry now thinking, I will make a career around copyright in AI-generated imagery. Um, Imad Mostak, who um, runs Stable Diffusion, is a very brilliant guy, um, said every media company is going to need a generative AI strategy. And I think that's true. They are. They're going to need it for protective purposes to make sure that Harry Potter isn't ingested into other systems. And they're going to need it for creative purposes to say, well, what can we do with these incredible systems? How can we change our workflows? How can we improve the economics of content production? Um, people are actually considering whether AI is capable of creating images, um, images and content at such scale that um, actually uh, in the future, human created content will be something of a rarity. So Imad Mostax told me, for example, that he thinks that in three to five years time, he'll be able to create an entire new series of Game of Thrones at the push of a button in the same way as you created that image of the valley with the flower in it yeah, now. And, and, so, and so we might find a massive scaling up of um, asset creation in the media, which, which will um, derive at some level from whatever was in the training data. So, so these are big, big issues that are both ethical, philosophical and legal which we've barely started to embrace and it's going to be a lot of fun i sort of wish uh, i don't know how you feel about this i sort of wish i was starting my career again and just think looking ahead for the next 30 years as we head towards artificial general intelligence um of figuring out the, this stuff because it's not going away head spinning stuff alex um mm. one of the obviously the areas that you, you you talk about this in the book and creativity and and how AI will use formulas to generate scripts and 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 music, mm. and, and and you know I was going back to the, the the formulaic approach to marking papers in schools, uh, or as you were saying, this idea of push a button and create uh, five versions of Game of Thrones, whatever. It feels like we're just making ourselves formulaic, and and as humanity, it's very interesting. And there's a pushback. Yeah, there's a. The there's this notion of endless content, the idea that, you know, I could create a human uh, scripted um, episode of Friends or series of Friends, and then at the push of a button, I could have endless friends forever, friends forever. 
And so in that in that equation, what's the role of humans anymore? Is it to is it to st- sit in studios in Hollywood making endless es- issues of friends or is it um, to just let the computers get on with it? And some people some might say that actually what the humans can do that the computers can't do is the truly innovative, the insight, the leap of faith, the the, the moment that Steven Spielberg conceived Jaws or that Star Wars was created. My favorite example being The Queen's Gambit. So that's so it's quite interesting, Queen's Gambit, because it's a, as you know, it's a hit Netflix show. And actually, Bella Bajaria, who is um, now the head of, um, I don't, I'm not sure, I can't remember her exact title, but she's basically the head of programming at Netflix, said there was no data that showed that a show about a 1960s female chess champion would be a hit. And so you could have done any any amount of algorithmic inquiry into that, but you would have not mm-hmm. found any data that that was going to be a hit. And yet, Netflix took the decision, you know, the ultimate data-driven company took the decision to make that show and that show was a hit. And you can say, well, that's what humans do. That's what humans do brilliantly. And um, maybe that's what we should be doing in the future. And and we'll and we'll let the computers get on with the replication and the rote uh, tasks that are required in, you know, asset management and asset creation, but the humans will do the true insight. But the counter argument to that is that machines actually can be creative, but in different ways. There's a rather lovely episode in a film um, about a, a, a deep mind computer system which played uh, the, the game of Go against a, um, uh, I think it's Korean chess uh, Go champion. Um, and the system is called AlphaGo. And he, he goes, this, this champion, Lee Sedol, goes for a cigarette break and um, he comes back to find that AlphaGo has played a completely bizarre move, a move that no human would ever have played. And it's put the piece on the wrong side of the board, well away from the action. And and sort of Go experts said that, you know, the whole history of Go, no one had ever played a move as silly as that. And of course, um, an hour down the road, that move has turned out to be the the creative insight that reinvented how you play the game of Go and won the match. And that move is called Move 37. It was the 37th move in the game. And there is a school of thought that says Move 37 is sort of philosophically indicative of how AI systems can be creative, albeit in different ways from how humans can be creative. And that that sort of nexus between how AI is creative and how humans are creative, I suspect will be one of the really big, fascinating themes in media, amongst many other industries, as we go into the late 2020s. Enormous amount of fun listening to you, Alex. Um, and your book is really fun. One of the I asked the internet uh, a if anyone had a question for you, and we did get someone, Malik Minhaj. He wrote in. He said, "Could we uh, talk? Could you ask him about how marketing managers, so to speak, another industry or any sector, uh, how marketing managers can leverage AI to enhance their creativity, innovation, and competitiveness?" Yeah. So, so AI is is huge in marketing already as i'm sure um you both know and uh in many different facets of marketing so interestingly enough um wpp which is i think the world's biggest marketing and advertising agency published their Indeed. annual results yesterday and um the story that was published in the paper today was ai helps wpp smash it on results essentially um where we see ai helping in marketing is obviously data analysis, so sophisticated clustering, which um, enables you to identify customer segments that are far too niche and far too nuanced for a human eye to have imagined them. And we see that playing out, for example, in recommendation on Amazon, um, you know, in retail advertising at vast scale and uh, other places in e-commerce in general. So that's one facet. Whether that's creativity is a slightly different thing. Um, In terms of the, the creative advertising process i know lots of people um we actually ran a program with a bunch of senior ad executives last year and they were very interested in ai as a tool for the creation of advertising assets um again as i was referring to earlier in in order so that they could be used in um the kind of a b testing at scale which is where each individual is somehow served a particular version of a uh, image or an advert it's such that that version will be the most compelling for them to then go and purchase and that's something you could always do on facebook ads manager but now it's possible at much greater scale where you're able to asset create in, in volume and therefore theoretically play minter the perfect shot of the garden shed that he's most likely to buy based on his entire purchasing history and that image having been created on the fly in a third of a second just before it was served to him via a programmatic ad so yes ai is 
everywhere in marketing. Uh, it's creating lots of issues. It's creating issues about data ownership. Um, you know, what, what what truly first party data do you have? Uh, can you can you manipulate third party data? Can you have access to it? Is it legitimate? It's uh, an issue in the training data sets. You know, what 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 data are we using, uh, and how, how where's that coming from uh, in the creation of assets, and countless other ways too in the workflow processes. You know, around, for example, editing commercials or create, uh, creating synthetic content um, assets for for ad advertorials or branded content or product placement and so forth. I think this. I think I would almost go as far as to say there is not a single area of marketing where AI is not important. Even something like public relations, which we traditionally thought of as kind of like taking journalists out to lunch. It's really not that at all now. If you talk, if you talk to people from the really big global PR agencies, a lot of what they're doing is kind of semantic analysis of how the global conversation is going around certain topics using tools like Signal AI, which is a rather brilliant British company who are analyzing the global conversation in real time for the sentiment that, you know, positive or negative towards any number of brands, countries, issues, individuals, and then enabling um, firms to intervene in a sophisticated way in the social conversation in order to try and point that conversation in a way that favors them or mitigates any downsides so yes it's it, ai and marketing is is huge it's a uh, it's um everywhere and, and fascinating hmm. well malik i hope you enjoyed that answer and um so last <laughs> question for you alex um you broke the book down into principles platforms producers and pioneers and uh, it's very structured. It's, uh, congratulations for the hard work you did on that. My interrogation was in section D on the pioneers. You you talk about the metaverse, esports, future media business, and you had podcasting as a pioneer element. I was wondering about that decision and and how you came up with putting it as a pioneer side as opposed to something a little bit more producer side. Yeah. So I think the reason I, I would put podcasting in the pioneer is, first of all, it's a or has been perhaps until this year, actually a very rapidly growing space. Secondly, podcasting is innovating business models in a really fascinating way. So it's it's it rather like digital publishing. It's kind of Petri dish for every possible way that you could monetize content. And one of the ways that podcasting is doing that is that, for example, people are using podcasting as a tool to develop content at low cost, which is then flipped over to say the streamers at a hundred times the budget. And, and many podcasting companies, particularly in America are doing that. And some traditional publishing companies, including Condé Nast Vogue have actually created podcast units specifically to do that. So there's innovation. So the reason I put it in Pioneers is there's innovation on business models like that. There's innovation on content formats as well. So I think there's some, some 5 million different podcasts on Spotify, including every possible content format. And um, our, overall, I think podcasting is capable of providing a um, sort of almost like a regulation free driver of how you do creativity in a multi platform way, audio and video, uh, in a sort of low cost, low risk environment. That enables that enables raw innovation to happen in the media in such a way that really isn't possible, for example, in the creation of film or even streaming content, because the stakes are just a bit too high. So I mean pioneers both in the business model sense and in the creative sense. Does that make mm. sense? Yes, it does. I, I obviously it's a space I occupy a lot, and I did a couple of festivals on podcasting a few years back. And uh, I, at that time, I was researching the Chinese market. And they have something like 100 million podcasts. Wow. Uh, so uh, the, and the interesting thing there in their business model is that they have the micropayment uh, installed. Anyway, they have the credit card installed as a sort of starting point, as opposed to us with the email or telephone number. And, yeah. and, and as such, make the financial element of a, of a podcast much more accessible and and easier to make money from. So I yeah. I'm glad yeah. I'm glad you think of it as a pioneering area. Lots of creativity, Alex. Time mm. is not uh, unending, unfortunately. And unlike some <laughs> of your endless creation ideas, which I love, I sparked that one. Um, Alex, how can someone follow you and, of course, get your book? Oh no! Well, no I mean, first of all, Benson, thank you so much for having me. It's been fascinating talking to you and and. Um, if I seem evangelical on this topic, it's because it's just fascinating, as I think you probably agree as well. Um, 
So yeah, if you'd like to read the book, just do just search Alex Connock, that's C-O-N-N-O-C-K on Amazon or search Alex Connock Routledge, the publisher, R-O-U-T-L-E-D-G-E. Um, maybe you, you can stick the link somewhere as well. Um, I, will. I always love hearing from people. I, I always, my, my platform of choice is LinkedIn. I like the positivity of LinkedIn. I find the sort of to and fro of Twitter a little challenging. So LinkedIn's great. Do connect. I always love to hear from people and I love to get into substantive conversations with people too. So Alex Connock, that's C O W N O C K on LinkedIn. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, and, you know, I, I've loved chatting to you. Pleasure's been mine, doctor. Take care. <laughs> Thanks, Minter. Thanks for having listened to this episode of the Minter Dialogue podcast. If you like the show and would like to support me, please consider a donation on patreon.com forward slash Minter Dial. You can also subscribe on your favorite podcast service. And as ever, rating and reviews are the real currency for podcasts. You'll find the show notes with over 2,000 and more blog posts on MinterDial.com. Check out my documentary film and four books, including my last one, You Lead, How Being Yourself Makes You a Better Leader. And to finish, here's a song I wrote with Stephanie Singer, A Convinced Man. A stranger tucked around me, precipitating the danger to feel free. Trust is a reason, still I won't tell the lie. I sit here passively, hope for your respect, anticipating the thrill of your intellect. Maybe I tell myself there's no use in me lying. I'm a convinced man building an urge. I'm a convinced man to live and die submerged. A convinced man in the arms of a woman. I'm a convinced man challenge my fate. I'm a convinced man competitions in me. A convinced man in the arms. Of a woman Despise revenges and struggle with deceit Live for the challenge so life's not incomplete What's wrong with challenge? I know soon we all die I like the feel of a stranger tucked around me Precipitating the danger to feel free Trust in my reason and let me show you why I'm a convinced man practicing my lines I'm a convinced man here in these confines A convinced man in the arms of a woman I'm a convinced man me to the test. I'm a convinced man. I'm ready for an arrest. I'm a convinced man in the arms of a woman.
Do you love news about LinkedIn, Indeed, Google, and just about every other recruitment tech company out there? Hell yeah. I'm Chad. I'm Cheese. We're the Chad and Cheese Podcast. All the latest recruiting news and insights are on our show. Dripping in snark and attitude. Subscribe today wherever you listen to your podcasts. We We out. out.